Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our Sunday service. Please turn to number 457, and we'll start our worship with Be Still My Soul. Be still my soul, the Lord is on my side. Patiently, the cross of grief or pain. Leave to thy crown, to order and provide. In Amen. That's the uh, sixth of 22 stanzas of the longest psalm in the Bible that's all about uh, the Word of God. 
And now let's continue our worship looking forward to the second coming in Advent with number 551, The King is Coming. The marketplace is empty, no more traffic in the streets, all the builders' tools are silent, no more time. To harvest wheat, busy hosts will cease the labors in the cold, no debate. Work on earth is all suspended as the king comes through the gate. I see, oh, the King is coming, the King is coming, praise God, He's coming for me. Happy faces line the hallways, those who lost have been redeemed, broken homes that He has mended. Little children and the aged, hand in hand, they're all alone. Who were crippled, broken, ruined, clad in garments white as snow. Oh, the King is coming, the King is coming. I just heard the trumpet sounding. His face I see, oh, the King is coming, the King is coming, praise God, He's coming for me. I can hear the chariots rumble, I can see the marching throng, the glory of God's trumpet. Spells the end of sin and wrong. We go roads are now unfolding. Heaven's grand stands all in place. Heaven's choir is now assembled. Start to sing amazing grace. Oh, the King is coming. The King is coming. I just heard the trumpet sound. I see, oh, the King is coming, the King is coming, praise God, He's coming for me. Amen. And that could be at any day, but right now we are present with Him. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you that we can gather here in this place to worship you in person, which we know is your will and which is the best way to have worship. We pray that your spirit would fill this place, fill each and every one of us. We pray that you would drive away um, any distractions that are within us and anything without that would oppose what you want to do in us as we worship you. And we pray that in all we do and say and how we follow through this day and all the days to follow, that you would be glorified in us. Amen. And now let us take our bulletin inserts and... Pray the prayer of confession that King David prayed after Nathan had confronted him. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, 
and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are proved right when you speak and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Surely you desire truth in inner parts. Teach me wisdom in the inmost place. Cleanse me with this, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O oh God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will keep transgressors your ways, and sinners will turn back to you. Amen. Remember, we're, we're all born sinners, but when we are in Christ, our sins are forgiven, and he is slowly making us to be more and more righteous and in his image. And the Apostle John was just so overwhelmed by the love of God for sinners and what Jesus the Messiah had done in his life in bringing him into the inner circle. Late in life he wrote, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And because of what Jesus did, we can stand in the presence of of the three times holy God and sing songs of worship to him. Let us now worship him with number two, holy, holy, holy. Oh, no. 
Amen, which means it is true. And now we will have the reading of God's word this morning. saying, Shall I of a surety bear a child, which am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the time appointed, I will return unto thee according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. Then Sarah denied, saying, I laugh not, for she was afraid. And he said, Nay, but thou didst laugh. And this is Genesis 21, 1 through 7. And the Lord visited Sarah as he had said. And the Lord did unto Sarah as he had spoken. For Sarah conceived and bare Abraham a son in his old age, at the set time of which God had spoken to him. And Abraham called the name of his son that was born unto him, whom Sarah bare to him, Isaac. And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac, being eight days old, as God had commanded him. And Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born unto him. And Sarah said, God hath made me laugh, so that all that hear will laugh with me. And she said, who would have said unto Abraham that Sarah should have given children suck, though I have borne him a son in his old age? And the last is, is St. Mark chapter 10, verse 27. And Jesus, looking upon them, saith, With men it is impossible, but not with God. Go with God, all things are possible. Amen. 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 And now, uh, let us go to the Lord in prayer.
<clears throat> Wonderful one God in three persons. We praise you for who you are, your perfection in all of your virtues, good, beautiful, true, just and merciful, strong love and great grace, and on and on. And we thank you for all you say and do, your word which you always fulfill in every detail, and your greatest work of sending your son to do what it is impossible for us to do in our own small strength that he would fully reconcile us to you by his great sacrifice on a Roman cross so our sins may be forgiven and we may walk with you in newness of life in the Holy Spirit. Help us to always live in the faith of the Savior even after our faith fails, as did Abraham's and Sarah's. In this church age, you most often turn people's hearts to you from sin and death to life in Jesus through the deeds and words done and said in love by your people. So please, help us to always be ready to be the hands, feet, and hearts you use to answer our prayers. And we pray that you will give numerous people peace, your peace in all the hot spots on this earth. First, in the Holy Land, as Hamas, which means violence, is exploiting and oppressing people who are only trying to live their lives the best way they know how. <clears throat> Please help many of these people to turn to Messiah Savior to receive the peace of reconciliation. And please give stronger faith in Jesus to people of Ukraine, Haiti, Nicaragua, and other places where believers in Jesus are under attack. This includes especially in North Korea, China, Iran, Iraq, Nigeria, Russia, and so on. Lastly, wake up your church in America to live and speak your truth and your love in Jesus. Convict us of our inactivity and direct us both individually and in our local churches to live as you have gifted us to live so we will not be stuck in our lethargy of inactivity. Forgive us, Lord. We pray for members of our cell in Christ's body. We pray for Elin, would you please infuse her with purpose and strength. We pray for Sally and Jimmy, please help them to persist in all they do to help people. And for Allie, please give her strength and help to witness to your grace and love so all in her family may come to an act of faith. We pray for Ken, Kurt, Rob, that they would all continue to grow in Jesus. And we pray you will continue to work in Peter, Linda, Billy, Norgie, and their mother. We pray especially for Al and his family. Give them comfort in their grief. Fill them with your love and peace. We pray for Christine. We also pray for Noel and Darren and my sister Linda. Please guide me now as I explain, interpret, and apply your word. And please be with us and in us in the sacrament of communion with you and with each other. And now we come to you with one heart and one voice in the words of the prayer Jesus gave his followers, praying. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil. 
for the light is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now before we go to God's word, we continue to remind ourselves that Jesus is the king and we want to be led by him. 513, lead on, O king eternal. much light in God and in Christ. Well, the God who rules over all that he created in strong life-changing love, truth, and justice is more wonderful than people can imagine or fully understand. He's more than able to do anything he desires to do. And this is the good news. His greatest desire is to be in a covenant relationship with all people he has created. And to bring this about, he communicates with people both directly through words he spoke, as we heard this morning, more supremely through his son, who became a man. And we heard from him also. And indirectly through his prophets. And one of his greatest qualities is that his words and actions are perfectly consistent. In other words, he will do exactly what he says in his time and in his way. And all who come to him on his terms will be his people. And they will, as one harmonious people, um, have him, choose him. He will be their only God, the only one whom they will wholeheartedly worship and love. And these general truths are the background for our stories today. When Abraham was 75 years old, Yahweh spoke to him that all nations of the earth would be blessed through his son with Sarah. And then 10 years later, unfortunately, Acting in unbelief, they took matters in their own hands in Yishmael, which means he will hear God. Read Genesis 16 to get the background. He was born through Hagar, which means to flee, which is what she did after Sarah got angry at her. But 
when Abraham was 99 years old, Yahweh God gave him and Sarah a second opportunity to trust in his humanly impossible word. Sarah laughed, I believe, with mixed motives, but Yahweh still kept his word exactly. And then some 4,000 years later, Jesus astonished the 12 apostles when he said, entrance into a close relationship with God is also humanly impossible. But with God, not only entrance into his presence, but much more is possible. So now let's dig deeper into these Bible stories this morning so that our, in, our faith, our faith in all of God's word may increase. So let's start with Genesis 18, which can be summed up that Yahweh speaks through three men to Abraham and Sarah. And then they share some food hospitality. And then he tells Abraham that Sarah will bear a son because nothing is too wonderful for him. Okay, so the first half of this passage, we find out that Yahweh is present in three men who stand by Abraham. And he and Sarah, as I said, share food hospitality with these men. So let's take it line by line. Then was seen Yahweh to him by the large tree of Mamre, which means strength. He is sitting, door of his tent, in the heat of the day. So first and foremost, we are told Yahweh was seen by him. Go back to the previous paragraph. We know it's Abraham. In a location suggesting great strength. So the great God comes to Abraham in a situation appropriate. Then we're told, then he lifted up his eyes, then he looked, behold, three men having been stood by him. When he saw, he ran to meet them from the door of his tent, then he bowed himself to the earth. So now we will soon discover, and we heard it already, that Yahweh speaks from these three men. I think taken in full context, and I'm saying this may be true, it may be that Abraham was being given some spiritual discernment that Yahweh is present in these men, in these men that he had never seen before. So having seen and beheld with astonishment, Abraham responds by running to and bowing worshipfully to these three strangers. Again, many he's never seen. Going back to the word, then he said, My Lord, if please, I have found grace in thy sight. Not please, pass by thy servant. Don't just go away. So from this request, it's still not yet clear if Abraham fully knows to whom he is speaking. However, notice he speaks to them collectively as one. Now, continuing on, he says, it will be brought, please, a little water, and they must be washed. What? The feet of you all. And then um, you all must be rested under tree. And I'll take a piece of bread, and you all must comfort the heart of y'all. After all of this, you all will pass on by, since you all have come to your servant. And then we're told graciously, they said, thus thou will do as thou hast said. So first, Abraham's concerned about them physically, their bodies. He says their feet will be washed, and their bodies will find comfort underneath the shade of this big, huge tree. Then Abraham offers to share bread with them, and they will be comforted in their heart. Okay? Comforted in their heart from all he will do for them as their servant. So they will go their way refreshed by him. 
Then again, Abraham is just running all around. We're told, then Abraham hastened into the tent to Sarah and said, quickly, three measures or seahs of fine flour thou must need, and thou must make bread discs. And to the herd Abraham ran. And then he took a calf, literally a son of the herd, tender and good. Then he gave to the young man, and then he hastened to prepare it. So first, Sarah. Abraham delegated the preparing of the bread cakes using the best of flour to Sarah. And then he chose a calf from the herd so that the meat would be tender and tasty and he delegated the preparation to a trusted young man. Finally, then he took the butter and the milk and the calf which had been prepared by Sarah and the young man then he set before them, and he's standing by them under the tree, and they ate. So this concludes the first portion. Abraham showed great hospitality to these three men by making sure that they had the best food that he could possibly give them, and they could eat it in peace while he stood by under the tree watching over them. Okay, that was then. What can we learn in general from this part of the story? Let us all open our hearts and lives to God so that we may share generously out of love for him and as an act of worship to him. Then we're told in the next part of chapter 18... He, he says to Abraham that Sarah will bear him a son in the spring. She laughs, and he says, nothing is too wonderful for Yahweh. So going back to our text, then they said to him, where is Sarah thy wife? And he said, behold, in the tent. So now the men inquire about Sarah's whereabouts, and Abraham gives the answer. And now we see a shift. We've been dealing for some time now with a plurality, with the three men, you plural. Then he said, to turn, I will return to thee at the time of life, and behold, son to Sarah thy wife. And Sarah listening at the door of the tent behind him, then we get a little information. Abraham and Sarah, old being stricken in days, it had ceased to be to Sarah the way according to the women. So what's going on here? The speaker, and now it's becoming clearer, this is Yahweh, tells Abraham he will return the following spring. Spring is the time of life when everything gets greener and everything is blooming and blossoming. And at that time, Sarah will bear a son to Abraham. And now the Holy Spirit, I believe the Holy Spirit inspired everything, so this is the Holy Spirit speaking through Moses. Inserts a parenthetical truth that Sarah was postmenopausal. And in other words, with everything going on, their ages, 99 and um, 89, um, it was just humanly impossible that a son would be born to Abraham, that she could conceive. However, Yahweh has given his word, and this is the main point today. Yahweh's word is always guaranteed. He will act according to his word. Continuing with the scripture, then laughed to herself Sarah to say, after to grow old, me, it will be to my delight and, and my Lord old. And then Yahweh said to Abraham, now we know who's speaking. Why? Because of this. Sarah laughed to say, also of surety, I will bear, I, I, being old. She's just dumbfounded here. So, notice, though, that Sarah laughed inwardly. 
which means only God could have perceived what she was doing. I believe she may have had mixed emotions. She knows being a mother is impossible for many reasons. But if the voice that is speaking with her husband is right, what joy she would have. So it may be both sarcastic and joyful. And now, again, the Holy Spirit inspiring scripture says Yahweh is the one who's speaking through these three men. And he questions Sarah's laughing. Now, I'm speaking mostly for myself, but um, ask yourself if this is true. Sometimes when God's word is too good to be true, people protect themselves by saying it's not going to happen. Continuing, and here is a strong rhetorical question. Yahweh says, is made wonderful from Yahweh anything? At the appointed time, I will return to thee according to the time of life and to Sarah a son. That word translated in various ways most often means wonderful. It's one of the strongest words in the human language. Yahweh is the God of wonderful miracles. And he repeats himself so that Sarah will know absolutely Yahweh's word is always guaranteed. And then finishing up our portion of chapter 18, then denied Sarah to say, not I will laugh because I was afraid. And he said, no, for thou laughed. So Sarah's defending herself of her fear because of her fear. What if she gets her hopes up and she does not bear a son? But don't miss this. This is important. It is unbelief on her part in what Yahweh is saying. And now I want to make another application. Um, May we all learn from Sarah, that to pray, to pray this, that we will be able to see our inconsistencies, you know, where we may have a little bit of faith, but not enough, where we may think this, but we also do that. All the inconsistencies in our hearts, and let us be honest about them before God, and ask him in the words of the Father in Mark's gospel, help my unbelief. Remember when he believed that Jesus might be able to heal his son of that horrible demon, but he still had a smidge of doubt, and he said, help my unbelief. Let us just be honest about all of that. And now let's go on to Genesis 21 in the fulfillment. Sarah did bear Abraham a son who was called Yitzhak. And when he was 100 years old, meaning Abraham, And Abraham circumcised him. And then we will just see that our one sentence from Mark just amplifies all of this and takes it up from the mouth of God himself. Jesus says only God can bring people into his kingdom. So Sarah did bear a son and called him, he will laugh. At age 100, Abraham circumcised his son And Sarah laughed, the right kind of laugh, a joyful, God-inspired laugh. So we're told, then Yahweh visited Sarah according to what he said. Then Yahweh did to Sarah according to what he had spoken. Word deed, here we go. What the covenant God Yahweh says, he always does. And and here's an old cliche, more modern American His word is his deed. That's about the best thing you can say about anyone. It's always true of God. Then she conceived and then she bore Sarah to Abraham, a son in his old age, at the appointed time which he, Yahweh, had spoken to him. But here, notice the name change, Elohim. Then called Abraham the name of his son, who had been born to him, which she bore to him, Sarah, Yitzhak. So Sarah bore a son to Abraham when they were both old, 
according to the word of Yahweh Elohim. And Abraham named him Yitzhak. He will laugh. Yahweh's word was fulfilled in every detail. Yahweh's word is always guaranteed. Then circumcised Abraham, Yitzhak, his son, when he was eight days, as was commanded to him Elohim. And Abraham was 100 years old when was born to him Yitzhak, his son. So we go back. Uh, to a chapter before we started, Genesis 17, an important chapter where Yahweh gives more information about the covenant he established with Abraham. And it included that every male in his line from that point forward was to be circumcised on the eighth day of his life. Now, this is just the way I happen to look at things the eighth day is the first day of the second week of the boy's life. And we have to kind of, again, all scripture is from God. It's one complete story. Remember, Jesus was raised from the dead on the eighth day because he was crucified on the sixth day, the day before the Sabbath, six, seven, eight. There's some similarities and in, in meanings here. And also, this command to circumcise an infant boy at the start of the second week of his life. It's one of the many reasons why Christians who are following covenant theology baptize infants. If it was good enough under the original covenant of God, it's even better under the new covenant. That's what they would say. Now, in Scripture, a generation is the age of the father at the birth of his firstborn. So for those in Abraham's line, a generation is now a hundred years. And if you go back to Genesis 15, this is why he was told that his children, ultimately Israel, would be in bondage in Egypt for four generations or 400 years. And then she said, Sarah... Laughter is made to me, Elohim. All hearing with me will laugh for me. They will laugh with me. And then she said, who would have uttered to Abraham? She has caused to suckle children, Sarah, because I have born son in his old age. Sarah is now so full of joy. She's giving all the glory to God. And she went and told everybody, and everybody shared in her joy. You know, who'd have spoken? Who'd have thunk? Who could have ever spoken to Sarah a year before this that she would be breastfeeding a son at the age of 90? The word of the covenant God can make the impossible to happen because God's word is always guaranteed. And my last application this morning and before we go to the gospel, this part of the story, the history of the people of Israel going back to the founder of their faith, Abraham, should cause us to be greatly encouraged by the truth God always keeps his gracious word. Don't doubt it. Now let's jump up to Mark's gospel where Jesus said only God can bring people into his kingdom. And let's take the context, okay? If you don't have your Bibles open, I'll give it to you. A rich young man had just walked away from Jesus because he could not meet the requirement to enter God's kingdom, namely to sell all he possessed, give that money to the poor, and follow Jesus. He couldn't do that because his possessions possessed him. Now, this shocked the 12 apostles because, like many Jews, they just assumed wealth was a sign of God's approval. And Jesus has now shown them they were wrong to assume such people are saved, and they are saying to themselves, who then can be saved? And now we heard Jesus' response. Let's look at it in two parts. Having looked straight at them, Jesus is saying, with men, this is impossible. 
So here we have straight talk from Jesus. He's saying to the apostle, to the apostles, uh, tongue-tied there, similar sounding words, it is impossible for human effort to gain entrance into the kingdom of God. But, and this is a great word, not with God. For all, all is possible with God. God can do. God can do anything and everything according to his gracious will and his love of people. He can save whoever comes to him in humble, dependent, obedient faith in his faithful son. He can and will do this. Why? Because he's wonderful. Going back again to the passage about Abraham. This is a perfect follow-up to that passage. So let me now generalize our stories in conclusion. Yahweh makes himself present to people who are open to him. And then he reveals to them his specific word for their lives, even if they cannot believe it is possible. And because he is wonderful... He will always do what he says to people. And his son affirmed this truth with different words. Although some things are impossible for people, all things are possible for God. Yahweh's word is always, always guaranteed. And now, uh, as we begin to prepare our hearts for communion, let's sing number 260, Come Share the Lord. Everybody has uh, their communion kits. Uh, we will uh, move on to doing our responsive reading for communion. The table of bread is now to be made ready. It is the table of company with Jesus and all who love him.
So come to the table, you who have much faith, and you who would like to have more. You who have been here often, and you who have not been for a long time, and you who have tried to follow Jesus, and you who have failed. Come, it is Christ who invites us to meet him here. Loving God, through your goodness, may we know your presence in the sharing so that we may know your touch and presence in all things. We celebrate the life that Jesus has shared among all his community through the centuries and shares with us now. May one in Christ and one with each other we offer these gifts and with them ourselves a single living act of praise. Amen. And before we partake, let us pray. Holy Lord God, by what we do here in remembrance of Christ, we celebrate his perfect sacrifice on the cross and his glorious resurrection and ascension. We declare that he is Lord of all, and we prepare for his coming kingdom. We pray through you, Holy Spirit, this bread may be for us the body of Christ and this cup the blood of Christ. Accept our sacrifice of praise as we eat and drink at his command. Unite us to Christ as one body in him and give us strength to serve you in the world and to you, one, holy and eternal God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we give praise and glory now and forever. Amen. And now let us partake of the elements. I do believe that something miraculous happens in this sacrament. We are physical beings. We aren't just intellects or souls. And I think God has made a way through physical elements, two elements, that we actually take his presence into us and and that this is more special than anything else that we do in worship. 
So I, I pray that we always take it reverently, respectfully, joyfully with all of our hearts and just asking that this presence continue with us throughout all of our days. So now let's sing for our final song or hymn, number 16, How Great Thou Art. these good words from the Apostle Paul to the churches in Philippi. But what things were to me gains, these I have counted because of the Christ loss. Yes, indeed, I count all things to be loss because of the excellency of the knowledge, that's experiential knowledge, not just in the head, of Christ Jesus my Lord. Because 
of whom of the all things I suffered loss and do count them to be refuse that Christ I may gain and be found in him, not having my righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through faith of Christ, the righteousness that is of God by the faith to know him and the power of his rising again and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, if anyhow I may attain to the rising of the dead. That's one of my life passages. That's powerful, powerful stuff. And now, because Abraham is the father of the faithful, let's close with number 392, only believe.